Uh, thank you very much, Jeremy, and thank you for pulling this day together. It's been absolutely fascinating and wonderful um, uh, to, to, have to, to see the different threads uh, converging and separating again uh, in, in, our, in our conversation through the day. So thank you so much for, 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 for the day as a whole. Um, if I can, I'll just reply very quickly to Yazida's question. The answer to your question is in Chris, his book, Christianity in the State, which provides the sort of philosophic, political, philosophical um, uh, architecture uh, of, his, uh, of his social thinking. And one of the key texts informing that book is indeed Figgis's Churches and the Modern State. So Figgis was slightly the generation, slightly before Temple, and Temple is influenced by Figgis in a very interesting way. They, they're often presented as, as sort of um, opposites, Figgis being very suspicious of the state and Temple being very pro the state. In fact, um, they actually share a great um, attachment to these intermediate associations that Chris has been talking about, seeing them as, as more, in, both Temple and Figgis see them as more important than the state. And that side of Temple is often uh, forgotten uh, when he's presented as the sort of the great um, advocate of, of the, the modern state, which, which he wasn't um, in many ways. Anyway, um, almost from the moment uh, war was declared in 1939, Te William Temple was casting his mind forward to what would happen after the war. In a BBC radio broadcast one month after the declaration, a broadcast widely heard ac across Britain and welcomed by many, he spoke about the aims of the war and the need for a Congress of Nations to negotiate a peace uh, which would include all the countries affected, including Germany, once freed from the Nazi tyrants, in his own words. The mistakes of the Versailles Treaty, which had, brought, which had sought to punish Germany, should not be repeated. Instead, Temple outlined a bold and long-term vision for a federal union of Europe. Clearly, he was no Brexiteer. Um, that vision is yet to be realized, of course. But what kind of society would Britain itself become after the war? Uh, a few months later, Temple was given the opportunity to present his vision in more radio broadcasts, which were also printed in The Listener under the heading The Hope of a New World. And included, uh, these were talks were included in a book of the same title published in 1940. Uh, in these talks, typically for him, he ranged widely over the state of culture, politics, social justice, the nature of freedom, worship and prayer, the requirements of international justice, social justice in ownership and industry, education, etc., etc. Um, all of this with reference not just to the war, but to longer term movements uh, in culture and society stretching back to the 19th century. Even though the talks were being broadcast to the population as a whole, they had an explicit grounding in Christian faith and practice, with much attention to the question of how God answers prayer, suggesting they were primarily for a Christian and church-going audience. Now, this may be why there is not much evidence of the talks having made much of an impact, as visionary as they were. Which brings us to the striking contrast with Christianity and social order, the book that we've been considering today. The contrast is that this volume uh, made a massive impact, as we've already heard, greater than any other of Temple's many publications and initiatives. And as we've heard, it went on to sell so many copies. And the, as we've seen, it was a very handy little volume. It could be put in, in back pockets of service people. They would read it and pass it on to others. And so it had a, a wider readership than the number of sales indicates. The popularity is one of the reasons why Temple has been described as one of the architects of the post-war 
welfare state as we've already heard. So the question is this, why was Christianity and social order so popular in comparison to the radio talks, the hope of a new world, which in many ways were very similar? So I want to sort of unpack what I think are three reasons which show us, which give us an answer to that question, but also, also show us uh, part of the legacy that Temple's little book uh, hands on to us today. So the first, first part of the answer is to do with the origins of Christianity and social order. It was not written by a lone author writing under their own steam, but it came out of a high-profile conference, which has already been mentioned, the one at Mulvern in early 1941, and this was planned and organized uh, by a colleague of Temple's called P.T.R. Kirk, Prebendry Kirk, as he was known. And his name deserves to be uh, remembered alongside William Temple because, as, as I think I'll show, his involvement in this project, as it became, was crucial. He was uh, uh, the leader of the Industrial Christian Fellowship, which was a kind of chaplaincy and advocacy organization, and he was a friend and colleague of Temple's for many years. The conference had been called to consider how Christian thought could be shaped uh, to play a leading part in the reconstruction after the war. And there was a very high profile set of speakers, John Middleton Murray, T.S. Eliot, Dorothy Sayers, Sir Richard Ackland, uh, the philosopher Donald McKinnon, and the social theologian V.A. DeMont. There was also ma many bishops and about 200 clergy and laity. It's reported that the conference was overloaded and there was little opportunity for discussion, but Temple, William Temple did his usual party trick of uh, standing up on the, the, the last evening of the conference and producing a summary of this, the discussion which drew out the key points and gave the impression that everyone agreed on what had been said. It was quite uh, clever, really. The one issue that they didn't agree on was the issue of the common ownership of pr principal industrial resources, which was uh, toned down in the final resolution. Um, it's various issues raised by DeMont, DeMant, McKinnon and Murray were not addressed, um, but, uh, but at the end of the conference there was this conviction that uh, some key ideas and principles had been established. So, uh, John Kent, the uh, historian who has already been mentioned, uh, says that as far as the Church of England was concerned, Malvern undoubtedly expressed a resurgence of the more radical Anglican attitudes to unemployment and poverty, which had dropped into the background after 1926. And as he shows, for Temple, it was the start of a movement. Now, this is really the point I want to emphasize. Christianity and social order comes out of an organized, intentional movement to uh, persuade uh, British public opinion, particularly public opinion that went to church, the sort of center ground, but also others as well, uh, of the importance of these ideas. Kirk, in the month after the conference, speaks about the movement and the need to keep a broad range of support, including from Anglo-Catholics and Evangelicals and those in the center as well as on the left of politics. Uh, now we see the kind of momentum building in the summer of 1941 when Kirk informs Temple that the summary of the conference, the short summary, had now uh, been printed and distributed uh, over 200,000 times, 200,000 copies. Temple himself went on to write a 16-page summary which sold 30,000 copies. And uh, so in the, that same summer, they organized a series of meetings uh, in London with a small hand-picked group to discuss the practical objectives that they were looking for and to draw up what would become the suggested program at the end of Christianity and social order. 
all of which shows how the book, when published, would be tapping into something bigger and broader than the convictions of its author, namely a movement that was propelled forward by a swathe of leading figures and church people at the time. Temple was riding the crest of a wave. Secondly, the content of the book. Now, various features also show why it became so popular. Uh, we've had reference to the first three chapters which justify the right of the church to speak about these matters and to interfere in politics. Now, I, I accept today that probably isn't necessary, but at the time, that was the difference between Christianity and social order and the earlier talks, the radio talks, The Hope of a New World. In those talks, Temple didn't spend that time uh, laying out the reasons why he needed to speak about these issues. Whereas in Christianity and social order, it feels as if he's learned a lesson and that he, needs, he now knows he needs to win over that large swathe of British public opinion that didn't go to church and that didn't regard itself as signed up members of the Church of England. So he, he spends a lot of time, almost a third of the book, uh, doing just that. Um, so um, then the book, uh, if, you read, if you read the prefatory note at the start, that's very interesting because the book makes an explicit claim that it is standing on the shoulders of others. Uh, in particular, he, Temple refers to the Lambeth Conferences of 1897, 1908, which was the great socialist Lambeth Conference uh, when Temple wrote that uh, you, it was socialism or heresy, you had to choose one or the other, those were the days, and the Lambeth Conference of 1920. <laughs> and also on the, let's not be too Anglican about this because he was also drawing on ecumenical and international conferences, particularly the one that had taken place in Oxford in 1936, at which there had not been many Anglicans present, but was a very significant ecumenical conference on questions of social justice and he is drawing on those findings uh, as well. And he says, the principles which I lay down are not an expression of a pure, purely personal point of view, but represent the main trend of Christian social teaching. So this little paperback then has the authority of a significant body of corporate work by the churches behind it. Furthermore, within the pages, we can see T Temple casting his net ever more widely, and we've thought quite a lot today, helpfully, about the natural law tradition that he draws on. But he also draws on um, the work of um, uh, the Protestant uh, Lutheran theologian, Reinhold Niebuhr, who's also been mentioned, uh, with his uh, emphasis, Niebuhr's emphasis on the unavoidable brokenness and sinfulness of human social structures, which comes through at certain key points in Christianity and social order. Temple is making connections and building support with both Catholic and Protestant traditions of social thought in a very uh, uh, um, interesting way. Then, as well, uh, the prefatory note says that he's shown his, his, his manuscript has been peer-reviewed uh, by um, no less than John Maynard Keynes, who, um, who again, we've, we've heard about him. I don't need to say more on that, but he has a very a positive view of the contribution of the Christian tradition to economics and to social uh, uh, awareness. Also, R.H. Tawney, of course, and various other uh, academic e economists and uh, social scientists. In other words, Temple had, uh, uh, um, um, Temple had been worried that he, his uh, practical recommendations were too partisan, but his peer reviewers had said, no, no, you've got to include them, um, and uh, Keynes particularly uh, does that. Uh, and he says, Keane says, your, your views represent a middle position which in my judgment much needs emphasizing and bringing before the public. Your later suggestions are interesting and put in an appendix with a modest preamble are not likely to be thought unduly dogmatic or trespassing on professional ground. So Temple has that kind of 
uh, um, backup um, for, for what he is proposing. Um, and Tawny does the same. Um, he says, nearly everything I should desire is here, though of course of it would bear much expanding and will be expanded by others. And um, I'm, just, I'm just going quickly because I know time is short. So what we see then, uh, as I've argued elsewhere, is a consultative methodology guided by fundamental theological and social principles and drawing on the insights and recommendations of those better informed about the practicalities of forming policy recommendations on a range of social issues. Uh, this therefore produced a program recognized as having not only general goals, but the teeth of specific and highly relevant practical proposals, representing, as Keynes says, a middle position within the debate. So we've looked at the background to the book, we've looked a little bit at the content of the book, what's in it, and now thirdly and lastly I want to just l spend a moment looking at the follow-up to the book because that's equally important. Christianity and social order emerged out of and tapped into a wider movement of post-war social reform and reconstruction. The afterlife of the book also needs to be recognized. Temple did not publish the book and then move on to other things. He and Kirk planned a follow-up of mass meetings to raise the profile of the agenda. He had no trouble in attracting Sir Stafford Cripps, future Labour Chancellor, and Ackland, as well as other church leaders, to share his platform. The meetings were organized under the banner heading, which we've uh, Jeremy has already mentioned, of the Church Looks Forward. And these were hosted by the ICF, the Industrial Christian Fellowship, using that organization to do the facilitation of the meetings, beginning with the Albert Hall in September 1942. And that's where the Pathé uh, clip comes from, where Temple makes that joke about privatizing the air that we breathe. Uh, then to Birmingham, in November, Leicester in February 1943, Edinburgh in June 1943, and ending with a youth rally back in London in, in October 1943, to which I think David Jenkins went and uh, bears witness in his um, um, comment on Temple in the 1981 Theology Anniversary Edition of Temple's Birth. Um, don't forget to subscribe to the journal Theology. It's well worth doing. <laughs> um, so there was, and as well as that, helpfully, I would argue, there was controversy in the press about some of Temple's proposals on reforming the banking system. Now, he said more in his speech than he did in the book. And uh, he has, in some quarters, been criticized for what he said, not least by Edward Norman in his review of, of uh, Anglican social theology. Uh, but many others supported him, one commentator writing that he had taken the only step possible to a modern Christian leader in demanding that politics and economics should be Christianized. And um, this is the kind of area that Chris was touching on just a moment ago. In London's Evening Standard, Lowe, the, the famous cartoonist, showed that he believed Temple's proposals were more than just one suggestion for the reform of credit laws. His proposals were instead, in quotes, the Christian aim uh, for post-war reconstruction in the hands of the primate of all England, facing down the bulldogs of high finance. An editorial in The Spectator wrote enthusiastically that the effect of the controversy indeed is to impress on many people who had overlooked it that the new primate is a man of great knowledge and brilliant intellect as well as of abundant moral courage. Um, there is of course this hagiographical literature surrounding Temple which is, which is a bit of a, 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 a barrier uh, in terms of reaching the person himself in a critical way. Um, I think what I'm doing in this this piece is wanting to suggest that it wasn't just Temple that is responsible for what we're looking at today. There was a, a well-organized team around him, 
and others who were feeding into what he was doing and uh, an intentional movement that, that allowed the impact to have what it did. So, um, conclusion then, thank you for the, for the reminder. The slim chapters of Christianity and social order represent then just one moment in a wider trajectory of conferences, consultations, publications, mass meetings, and interesting controversy in the press. It's, it is the element of this, that, uh, uh, it, it, it is the element in all of that that retains a place in our memories, perhaps because it's a book that we can handle, pick up and read today. Uh, but the importance of that wider context for understanding its significance should not be lost. It's, uh, it's, our, its significance derives from that. While the book unmistakably comes from Temple's own pen, showing how in Tawny's words he had, a, he had a wonderful gift of packing essentials into a small compass without giving the impression of excessive compression, the leadership that it embodies is not his alone, as was the case in the radio addresses, The Hope of a New World, but was a leadership coming from a broad-based movement in church and society, one demanding equitable social reconstruction after the war. For those who seek to offer Christian leadership in the public realm today then, there is much that can be learnt from this, of the need to begin by building broad-based co coalitions of like-minded people and groups, of the need to organize consultations that pool thinking and produce practical programs that can be owned and promoted by all, and of the needs after publication of a program to follow through with intentional dissemination through mass meetings, use of different kinds of media, debate and advocacy that can instill hope and purpose to bring about meaningful change. Maybe that was Temple's distinctive contribution to all of this was the spirit of hope and purpose that he brought to, to all of that. All of this is needed to make an impact and Christianity and social order offers an example of a text that can stand at the center of such a movement. Thank you very much.